Okay, good morning everybody. Thanks for slogging in through the snow. Uh, we will finish our discussion of continuous time recurrent neural networks today, CTRNNs, which as you'll recall from last time is a particular uh, flavor of neural network that is designed so that the values of the neurons cha are changing continuously over time. And we will see at the end of lecture eight today why that's useful for evolving robots to exhibit adaptive behavior. And then we will dive into lecture nine where we will look at four different experiments in minimal cognition. And in all of those four experiments, we will be looking at relatively simple agents that are equipped with CTRNNs and are evolved to exhibit the building blocks of intelligence, which when we talked about the history of AI, we touched on towards the beginning of the course. So as you will see in the four minimal cognition experiments, they look like physical Turing tests. They are meant to evolve agents that move about and do things that if you didn't know what was going on inside the head of the agent, you might point at it and say, I don't know if that agent is intelligent, but at least it is on the road towards intelligence. It is starting to exhibit the building blocks of what you would expect from an intelligent agent, regardless of whether that agent is an, organ or an organism or a machine. Okay, that's where we're, we're headed. Uh, any questions about assignment four? Grad students seven and eight, all good? Question, yes? Um, I have a question about assignment six. About assignment six, okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. Good, good question. Okay, so the question is about assignment six. For those of you that haven't got there yet, that's fine. You're implementing the simplest and weakest of all the evolutionary algorithms that we're looking at in this course, the hill climber, where if you'll remember, you have a single parent and a single child. So again, uh, in all evolutionary algorithms, a little bit of randomness, right? You're starting by creating random individuals. And when a parent produces an offspring, we introduce a random change to the genome. So if your numbers aren't exactly the same as ours, that makes sense, right? What we're looking for, and somewhere in here there should be a screenshot, uh, what we are looking for when you submit your hill climber is you're printing out just two columns of numbers, right? The left column is the fitness of the, of the parent, and then every once in a while in the second column, which is the fitnesses of the children, wherever a parent produces a child that has a higher fitness than the parent, what we expect or what the TA will expect to see is that the next row, the value of the child becomes the value of the parent, which shows us that you've correctly turned the child into the new parent. It's replaced the previous parent and on we go. So we're not looking at the exact values, but we're looking at hints in those two columns of numbers that you've implemented the hill climber correctly. Does that answer your question? Okay, any other questions? Anything between four and eight? No? Okay, so back to uh, CTRNNs, lecture eight, we started a, uh, a brief discussion about calculus, which for our purposes is just to remember that we're going to be developing differential equations that describe how something, in this case x, changes as a function of time. And we ended last time by starting to build a differential equation that describes how y sub i changes over time, which is the value of the ith neuron inside a CTRNN that has multiple neurons inside it. If you build a CTRNN that has 27 neurons inside of it, you're going, to, you're going to track the behavior of that CTRNN with 27 differential equations, one for each neuron, right? Okay, um, as I mentioned last time, we're going to gradually build up this equation one term at a time, and each term in this differential equation is meant to capture some feature of real neurons. We ended last time by just saying the rate of uh, neuron I over time, the rate of y sub i uh, is going to change as a function of its current value inverted or negated. So if we start by setting the value of y sub i to be plus 1, 
it will start to decay down to zero. And if we set the value, uh, the initial value of y sub i to be minus one, it will also decay up towards zero, which is meant to represent the resting potential of neurons. Your neurons in your head are energy hogs. They need a lot of energy. So when they're not doing any useful work, they will decay back to their default state. Real biological neurons are, very, are fantastically complex machines in and of their own right. If you look inside a biological neuron, there is no single value, plus one, minus one. There's lots of things going on. But at a first approximation, we're going to think here about neurons that if they're not stimulated from the outside, they will decay back towards, for the moment, zero. So far, so good? Okay, let's pause here. So we're going to build up this differential equation. But remember that we, uh, that we can also describe neural networks using difference equations, which is the discrete form of a differential equation. Discrete in terms of time, right? So in a difference equation, we describe on the left-hand side the new value equals some function of the old values, right? The values at time t are combined in some way to produce the new value of that thing at the next time step, t plus 1. So given our discussion about neural networks from a, f a few weeks back, generally speaking, the value of a neuron, in this case x sub 1, doesn't really matter whether it's x or y for our purposes at the moment, is a function of all of the neurons that are pointed, that have synapses that go from that other neuron to neuron 1. So you can actually write down the equation to describe a neuron in a traditional neural network using a difference equation, right? The value of x1 is, at the next time step is the value of its current value if it is connected to itself. And we talked about recurrent connections and self-connections, or recurrent synapses and self-synapses a few weeks back, right? Plus the weight that connects neuron 2 to neuron 1. So we take the value, the current value of x2, multiply it by the weight of the synapse connecting 2 to 1, and so on. So we compute that weighted sum, and then we push it through sigma. What does sigma represent? The sigmoid is, the, is a particular form of the activation function. So activation function is that term for all the different ways that we can squash uh, the incoming neural values. Usually in the neural network literature, it's sigma, something that just squishes, the sigmoid squishes it to a value between minus one and plus one. So this is the main difference between traditional neural networks and CTRNNs. Traditional neural networks were updating the value at discrete time using difference equations. And in CTRNNs, we we're going to be armed with a way of describing their behavior in continuous time. And we'll see why we would want to do that in a moment. So far, so good? OK, so let's push on. Let's introduce a new parameter, tau sub i. So Google Slides doesn't do this very well, but this is the Greek letter tau. So tau starts with a t, which is a reminder that this actually has to do with the timing behavior of the neuron. So I'm going to redraw this curve multiple times as we add new behavior, uh, new behavior to our neuron. You'll notice that the tau is on the left-hand side, which you might not have seen with differential equations before. This just makes it easier to write this down. This is obviously equivalent to y prime equals a numerator divided by tau sub i. Right? We're just moving it to the left-hand side. So we don't have to write everything as fractions. Doesn't, doesn't really matter for our purposes. What does tau sub i do? How does it influence the behavior of the neuron? The neuron is still, if unstimulated, it's going to decay back to zero. But what do different values of tau do? Remember that as we're building up this equation, which is a differential equation, it's altering how the neuron behaves over time. Let's try and build up an intuition for what tau does, which is let's set tau to be a very large number, 1 million, or 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12. 
very large number, how does that alter the behavior of the neuron? It's still going to decay down to zero, but tau is now a very large number. So how is it influencing the way in which it decays to zero? A straight drop. Is that true? Is it increasing the rate at which the neuron drops towards zero? We have a large value of tau. The tau is on the left-hand side, so if you divide both sides by tau, you end up with y prime equals minus yi divided by tau. So you have a very large number on the denominator inside a differential equation. What's that? Not quite a straight decrease. Yes? It's a small, it's a, it's a much smaller number right on the right hand side. Whatever minus y sub i is, actually let's start again by setting it to plus one. On the right hand side, at this point in time, when we evaluate the differential equation, it's plus one divided by a million, which gives us a very small decimal. At this point in time, y prime equals 0. 0.000001, oh, sorry, minus 0. 0.00001. How does this neuron behave? The rate, of change will be the rate of change is small. The rate of change is minus 0. 0.0001. It is going to drop very, very slowly and only gradually uh, approach zero. So neurons that have a large magnitude time constant, or tau, are Eeyore neurons. Anybody remember Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore? Didn't like to be pushed around, right? Eeyore knew what he was going to do. He was going to do it in his own time. Didn't really matter how you influenced him. He would eventually do what he's going to do, but very, very slowly. He was resistant to change or perturbation from the outside world. Okay. Tau, for our purposes, is going to be a floating point value. It could be positive or negative. What happens if tau is a very large negative number? So let's go back to t0. Let's set the initial value of y sub i to be 1. And tau is now minus a million. Becomes a tigger, how so? It's just a lot faster. Instead of being gradual, so you can just jump right into it. Is it faster? Is it a tigger neuron? Is it jumping all over the place? Let's take the tau and move it to the right-hand side. So we have. On the numerator, minus y sub i at the current time, which is minus 1, divided by minus a million. It's going to increase very slowly. It's still an Eeyore neuron. It's just actually now moving away from its default value. Right? For our purposes, it doesn't matter too much whether tau is positive or negative. What matters for our purposes today to build up an intuition for how CTRNNs work is whether it's a large magnitude or small magnitude value of tau. So now, let's go back to plus a million and change the time constant to be very small, very close to zero. Let's set y sub i to be 10 to the minus 6. Let's set the initial value of y sub i to be 1. How does that neuron respond? Now it's a Tigger neuron, right? Minus 1 divided by 10 to the minus 6 is a very large number, which means the rate of change, y sub, y sub i prime, equals a very large number. It's going to change, the value is going to change a lot from one time point to the next, right? So off we go and down the value plummets and might go right past, uh, right past zero. At this point in time, we now have, let's say, we now have the value sitting at minus 0.9. How does the neuron respond at the next time instant with the same very small magnitude tau? 
it shoots back up, right? So we plug in the values to the differential equation on the right-hand side, minus, uh, mi minus 0.9 negated is plus 0.9, so rate of change is positive now, divided by a very small number. Minus 0.9 divided by 10 to the minus 6 is a very big positive number, and up we go. I like the Tigger metaphor, it's perfect, right? In the old days, we call this the Woody, Na the Woody Allen neuron. Any slight perturbation, it's all over the place, right? It's very sensitive to any, any value outside uh, zero. That value might be coming from within for the moment, or it might be some external perturbation. Whatever it is, it's going to react quickly and a lot, right? So the time constant is actually uh, a very, the most unique property of CTRNNs, which is kind of interesting. You can imagine taking the tau and turning the knob and making the neurons uh, inside the CTRNN more or less sensitive. So far so good? Okay. Let's keep developing our uh, equation to describe how the IF neuron in the CTRNN changes. This part of the equation hopefully by now looks somewhat familiar. We have this neuron inside the CTRNN, but of course there are incoming synaptic weights to that neuron, described by W. And W has two subscripts to remind us that there is a weight connecting, uh, a synapse connecting a pair of neurons. So the weight going from neuron J to neuron I multiplied by the value of Y sub J. So the rate of change of the ith neuron is now a function of its current value. It's a function of its sensitivity dictated by tau. And its new value, its rate of change, is also dictated by the values that are coming in. Right. So this is a little different from traditional neural networks where the new value of the, of the neuron is the summed weight pushed through the sigmoid becomes the new value of the neuron. Here, the influence on this neuron of all the other neurons that connect to it is altering its rate of change. So it's indirectly influencing I's new value. But what it's really doing is influencing its rate of change. Right? Imagine we compute just this sum here, and this overall sum is positive. How does that influence the behavior of I? Forget tau and y sub i for a moment. This term, this overall term evaluates to a positive number. How does that influence y sub i? It's going to increase, right? If the current value is negative down here, it's going to start trying to rise. If the current value of y sub i is also positive, it'll still try and increase. But there are other things that are acting on that rate of change, right? It depends on this value and it depends on tau, right? So all of these things are combining to dictate how this value is going to change at this point in time. Question? Um, sorry, I think I'm just unclear on sure. what y prime sub i is. Okay. So that's the rate of change, not the new value. Co now. Correct. It's the rate of change, right? We're dealing with differential equations. So what we need to remember is at any point in time, we have to have in hand the current value of y sub i which is y sub i. We compute y prime at that point in time. So we now have the current value and the rate of change, right? When we evaluate this differential equation, we get back one number which says how that neuron is going to change values. We combine those in some way, which we're kind of papering over this morning, right? So we can integrate our differential equations to say the current value at this time is this value, and we want to know what its new value is at this time, or potentially this time, or this time, or this time. As we, we approach the current time, things get tricky, and that's why we're using differential equations rather than difference equations. If you remember back to our discussion about physics engines last week, we introduced the time step, right, which you can set in PyroSim. You can dictate how much time elapses between one time step and the next. If you're dealing with a CTRNN inside PyroSim, 
then the new value of y sub i, given the current value and the rate of change, is dependent on how on the time step, right? It's going to combine those three numbers, time step, current rate of change, current value, to come up with the new value. Yeah? All that integration, that computing of the new value is all taken care of for you by the physics engine. What's important for us is to think about how changing the parameters, like changing w here or changing tau, how that changes the behavior of the neuron. Question? So does that mean that the physics engine dictates the PIN? We dictate the tau sub i value. If you've gotten to the motors part of, or you all have gotten past the motors part uh, in the assignments, if you go look at the PyroSim documentation, you can set tau on motors, uh, sorry, you can set tau, the tau on motor neurons and hidden neurons, I think. You dictate tau, and then evolution is dictating the behavior of the neurons, but how, the rate at which they change is being influenced by the value of tau that you send to those neurons. Yeah? Now, you can set those values of tau, or, as you, some of you might have guessed in where this is going, we're not just going to evolve in the next lecture when we talk about the minimal cognition experiments, they were not just ev evolving w, they also evolve the taus for the neurons. Evolution is going to have control over how much, uh, how, how sensitive the neurons are to whatever values they receive. Yeah. Question? Go ahead. Um, so when we're talking about the changing neurons, what exactly is changing? Like the amount of energy it's using? Or Good question, right? So exactly, what is this vertical, what, what is this vertical axis? For now, it's just a number, right? The value of y sub i. So what does it represent, right? So if you study biological neurons, they are obviously electrical conduits, right? They send electricity from one neuron to the other. So you can think of this number as voltage. That's usually a good, good way to think about it, right? It's, uh, as usual, when we're dealing with biology, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, but if you're interested in the neural physiology of neurons, what they're really doing is sending spikes of voltage from one to the next. So we're really describing this value at the moment as just a single value, and it's changing continuously over time. But real neurons don't work like that. They send discrete pulses of voltage or current to other neurons, and they do that by sending spikes to one another. And the time between spikes is the information, or at least we think that's the information. There's a lot of other information going on. So real neurons don't communicate with each other continuously like we're doing in CTRNNs. There are an additional class of neural networks out there in the literature that are called spiking neural networks that do build in that additional detail. But that additional detail is lacking from CTRNNs and the other neural networks we're going to talk about in this class. Yeah. So for our purposes, you can think of this value as voltage or force or power. It is some or a bit of information. It is something that is being sent from one neuron to the other. All good? OK. Onward. OK. We are going to add in our activation function. So this also exists in. Uh, CTRNNs, but they're inside, they're inside the summation, and they're inside, they're applied before the weight is applied, uh, before, the, before the weight is applied to y sub j, which seems like a weird place to put the activation function, right? So let's think about this. Traditional neural networks that we've seen so far, we compute the raw weighted sum. We're sitting at x1, we're sitting at neuron x1, and we sum the incoming values from the other neurons, which you can think of as incoming voltage. We multiply it by the weight of connection, how much of the voltage leaves y sub 2 and how much of it gets to 
uh, sorry, x2, how much of the voltage gets to x1, right? That weight is sort of constricting or opening the conduit between x2 and x1. We compute that weighted sum and then we squash it to a value between 1 and minus 1. In C tier and N's, we're going to squash the value of Y sub J first and then multiply it by the weight, subtract the current value of Y and divide by tau. Seems like kind of an odd, an odd thing to do. The intuition here is we're going to assume when we have the current value of y sub i, and we have the rate of change of y sub i, that raw value, the current value of y sub i is not squashed. It could be anything. It's whatever we compute at that time. And it's only when a neuron tries to send a signal outward to another neuron that we squash it with the activation function. So in this equation at the moment, we're, gonna su we're, we're sitting at neuron i, and we're now going to consider all the other neurons in the CTRNN. That's what the uppercase N represents. It's the total number of neurons in the CTRNN. So I is going to look at all the other neurons, and it's going to consider the weight that connects that neuron to itself. If there is no weight, then W is 0, and it doesn't contribute to the sum. But if we get to another neuron, neuron J, and that neuron does have a synapse that connects J to I, we're first going to squash the value of J. So there's some internal value to y, y sub J, which hasn't been squashed. It's whatever it is. And the minute it emits a voltage or it sends out a signal along W, J, I towards I, we're going to squash it to be 1 and minus 1. So it actually doesn't really matter where the squashing is. You can think of the internal value of the neuron as unbounded. But whenever we read out a value from that neuron, we need it for something It's going to get squashed by the activation function. In this case, in CTRNNs, they tend to use the hyperbolic tangent, which, like the sigmoid, also squashes any value between minus infinity to plus infinity to a value between minus 1 and plus 1. Actually, in practice, it doesn't matter too much how we do that squashing. So far, so good? OK. We're going to introduce some other things we haven't seen before. We are also going to associate with every neuron in the CTRNN a gain value. So you'll notice as we are building up this equation, some of the terms in this equation have a single subscript which is a reminder, if it's a single subscript, it means that value belongs to the ith or the jth neuron in the CTRNN. If uppercase n equals 27, we have a 27 neuron CTRNN, each neuron in that CTRNN has its own tau value, and it has its own gain value, right? The double subscript reminds us that it's describing a parameter of a pair of neurons, right? In this case, WJI describes the weight of influence of one on its paired neuron. Yeah? OK. Why introduce a gain? What is the gain doing here? Again, our differential equation is getting a little more complicated, so it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around how changes to G influence I and the rest of the neurons. In any differential equation or any mathematical equation you're trying to build up an intuition with, the, the first thing to do is usually set that value to zero, and what happens? So imagine there's a neuron inside the CTRNN, and it has a gain value of zero. What does that mean? It has no influence on the, on like YI. It has no influence on YI. You can see obviously how the influence of Y sub J drops out of its influence on the rate of change of Y sub I. But it doesn't only do that. It doesn't only silence J talking to I. The gain has a single subscript, J means there's a gain value associated with the jth neuron. If that value is 0, what does that mean? It doesn't have an effect. 
on anyone, on any other neuron in the population, right? Remember that if we have 27 neurons, we have 27 versions of this differential equation. We have 27 differential equations. Somewhere in there, there's a Y sub K, yet some other neuron. And if J connects to K, the gain G sub J is still zero. J also cannot communicate to K. Right? So in essence, a gain of zero is like the volume of, J, of neuron J that we've turned all the way down to zero. No one can hear whatever J has to say. As, as you can imagine, we're going to let evolution play with the Ws. Evolution is also going to be able to play with the Taus. And it's also going to evolve the gains. Why create this additional variable? Exactly, right? So it gives evolution an ability by mutating and changing the values of G over evolutionary time to turn up or turn down the volume of individual neurons. And a gain that evolves towards zero is evolution basically turning off that neuron and all the outgoing synapses from that neuron. If for whatever reason it's, it's useful to the robot for the jth neuron to be shut off, of course evolution could shut off J by evolving all of the W sub J's to go down to one, right? So all of the outgoing synapses from J, evolution could go and turn them all down to zero, but that would require multiple mutations, and each one of those mutations should produce a robot that's better than its parent, or that change is not going to exist. It gives evolution a chance through one mutation to turn off or maybe almost turn off a single neuron, or alternatively, turn up the volume of one neuron. Right? Over evolutionary time, one of those 27 neurons in the CTRNN may start to become very imp important, quote unquote, to the behavior of the robot and it's useful to turn up the influence of J on everybody, right? It's just sort of giving evolution another option for how to modify the neural network, right? It's kind of, the J's are kind of redundant with W, but there's a bit of a, an advantage here. Okay, let's keep going. Wait, sorry, your yep. point there was that if it wanted to turn up the volume of one neuron yes. without G, it would have to turn up the individual weights connecting that neuron to every other neuron. It doesn't have to. So if we want to right. turn up, if, if evolution wants to turn up the volume of the jth neuron, there's two ways it could do it. It could hit all of the W sub j's, which means all of the synapses that are going out from j to other neurons. It would turn up the weights of all of those. But the probability that evolution would hit just the right place to turn them all up rapidly approaches zero. So it can do it in one mutation by hitting just, by just increasing the value of G sub J. That turns up the volume of J. And if that helps the behavior of the robot, that mutation will survive into the next generation. Make sense? Okay. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, in the very inner parts of this equation now, we're introducing theta sub J single subscript, so it reminds us again that each of the 27 neurons in the CTRNN have their own theta. What does theta do? As it says, it's the bias. How does that influence the behavior of a neuron? This one's harder to wrap your mind around because it's in this very inner part of the equation. Uh, increasing the weight of the gain, uh, maybe, right? It depends obviously on the value of Y sub J. And Y sub J is the current value at this point in time of the Jth neuron. It's a constant offset, right? So we started by describing Y sub I and describing at the beginning how it decays down to zero. Remember that all 27 neurons in the population 
are all, they all have a minus y on the right-hand side. So they are all, regardless of their value, they are all trying to decay down to zero unless they get some external input. So if we wire up all of these neurons, they're all going to zero. They're all influencing each other less and less because they are shouting quieter and quieter. And the whole set of 27 neurons will very quickly go to zero, right? So the bias introduces an easy way for evolution, if evolution sets these thetas to be non-zero, so that a neuron no longer decays to zero, right? When we read out the value of y sub j, remember we're taking y sub j, we're seeing how it influences i. When we read it out, its value of j may be changing, but it is decaying to, on its own towards its own theta sub j, right? If we assign a, a positive theta to one neuron, that neuron will tend to oscillate around that offset, that bias. Again, it's a bias. It can be pushed away from that value depending on its other parameters. Another neuron in the same neural network that has a negative theta will tend, no matter what happens to it, to generally, if, no, if nothing is happening to it, it will decay back towards its own bias, right? So what that means is y sub j tends to have a negative value. And if it's influencing other neurons, it's got, on, on average, a negative influence. It's trying to pull down the other neurons that it connects to. Another neuron in the, in the, in the CTRNN that has a po positive bias that tends to stay around that positive value, when it sends its value after it's been gained and squashed, when it sends its value out along its weight to other neurons, it's tending to lift them up. It's having a positive influence on that neuron's rate of change. Yeah? So by playing around with different, uh, different thetas, you can connect up a bunch of neurons, and they don't all gradually go back to zero. They will bounce around, and you'll get very rich dynamics which gives evolution some richer material to play with. OK. But of course, in this course, we are not just connecting up a neural network. We are connecting up the neural network to the world, right? This CTRNN is going to be, we're going to place it inside uh, a robot, and it's going to influence the robot's behavior. And this neural network is going to influence the robot's behavior as a function of not just all this stuff, but also what's coming in from the outside. So the final term we're going to add to our equation, we're just going to add it on at the end. And this is unfortunate notation from CTRNNs, uppercase i, subscript lowercase i. So the uppercase i is just a reminder that this is input from the outside world. OK. As I've written down here as a reminder, sorry. We have 27 neurons in our, in our hypothetical CTRNN here, and we assign, we connect some of those 27 neurons to the robot's sensors. If it's a four-legged robot and it's got four touch sensors, maybe we tag four of the 27 neurons with this additional I term, and the remaining 23 neurons, they have an I, uppercase I sub I of zero. They're not getting any influence from the outside world. So by adding in this term to a subset of the neurons in the CTRNN, we are connecting the outside world to the CTRNN. Yeah? OK, let's assume in a hypothetical situation that all the values on the right-hand side here, they are all 0. So everything, uh, uh, but not the tau, because if we have a tau 0, we're in trouble. So let's assume tau is very low, doesn't really matter. Let's assume that sort of everything here is zero, and the only thing we have left is y prime equals input from the outside world. How does incoming sensor values influence neurons in a CTRNN in this simple case? The neuron will? What, the neuron will not have the value from the outside world. We're close. The change. The change, right? We've got to think like a, 
think in calculus world here, right? The incoming value, let's say there are four touch sensors, and those touch sensors can be either plus one, the foot is on the ground, or minus one, the foot is off the ground. If the foot is on the ground, this value is one, the rate of change of the IF neuron is up. And it's going, as long as that neuron remains uh, at plus one, the rate of change of that neuron is going to go up indefinitely until the neuron, until the robot lifts its leg, at which point uppercase I becomes minus one. And the, neuro, the rate of change of the IF neuron is now negative. It's dropping, right? So values out in the real world do not directly set values of neurons in CTRNNs. They influence how those neurons change. As a function, of course, of all the other influences on the rate of change of the IF neuron. How would it be affected if that instead of like on the outside if you had that in like with the bias? Like if you had it as like J. Uh, you you could try that, right? So we could you mean include it right in here, for yeah. example, right? So what does that mean? We now have the I inside. Does it more directly affect the value of the actual neurons? More like Good question. Immediately? Sorry. You That's okay. <laughs> trying to run some calculus in my head. Leave that as an exercise for the reader, the questioner. Good. Actually, it is useful to try and change around some of these terms and to make, the, make your life easier, zero out the other elements of the equation and to think about how the change you made to the differential equation is gonna change how that neuron changes as a function of the values that are coming in. Yep. Uh, can it be think, thought of as a memory? Maybe. It's basically the default behavior of that neuron, right? So it's not strictly memory. It's not getting information from the outside world and sort of storing it somehow. It's, as the name implies, the bias. It's what the neuron tends to do. And again, that is, that is uh, incorporating a detail from biological neurons, which, not surprisingly, not all biological neurons in the same organism are the same. They have different features and they react on average differently to their input. That's what the bias uh, is meant to represent. And the, vol and the gain for that matter, right? What if uppercase I is zero? We have some, let's say now the neuron is uh, an angle sensor sitting at a rotational joint and the current angle is zero for a while. The, the sensor is reporting zero. What is that doing to Y sub I? Not, it's, the neuron may still change as a function of these, but it's having no influence on the change of that neuron, right? It's not holding it constant like this term does or bringing it back to some value. It's just nothing. It's not influencing how Y sub I changes. Okay, all right, so that's obviously a fair bit of math to try and understand this now relatively complicated C, T, R, and N. Yes? So is I or J the number of neurons or both? Uppercase N is the number of neurons, right? So we're gonna look at a few experiments. In some cases, the agent is equipped with a C, T, R, and N of five neurons. In some cases, it's several hundred. There is one differential equation for every neuron in the C, T, R, and N. The I and J, as usual in math, are just indices, right? If we want, we know that there are N of these things, but we can't talk about all N at the same time. So I and J is just our way in formal notation to say that one. We're talking about this one here, I. And if we need to talk about another one that's influencing that one, we introduce J. So this one is behaving like this. That's all the, the I subscripts. And the influence of I is being altered by J, this other neuron, right? But we need to remember at the back of our mind that this is all occurring simultaneously across all uppercase N neurons, or in any system that's being described by multiple differential equations. So is J the neurons that are connected to I? Correct, right? So this summation here, it's a little bit lazy because we're iterating over all uppercase N, right? 
but not probably not all neurons are connected to every other neuron. So we're, although we're iterating over all neurons, including I, we're only considering, the, the, or this value of this term here is only evaluating to a non-zero value for the j's that actually connect to i. And for each of the i-th neurons, each of the 27 neurons, that may be different subsets. The first neuron may have five incoming synapses. The second neuron may have 17 incoming synapses. Right? So the number of times we get non-zero terms back from the summation is going to be different for the different neurons in the CTRNN. Don't feel bad if this is now beyond your intuition. It's also beyond most humans' intuition. If I gave you a set of 27 ordinary differential equations and said, we're going to drop this inside a robot, and we want the robot to go to the blue block and pick it up, give me all the taus, the w's, the g's, and the thetas that will make that happen. I don't know about you, but I can't do it. So we're going to turn it over to evolution to optimize not just synaptic weights, but the taus, the weights, the gains, and the thetas. You can try. So do people like give it more options than it needs and then have the gain as like a way to shut off synapses that aren't necessary? That's a great question, right? So in practice, it's not that the human is gonna try and set is gonna try and build up an intuition and set all of these parameters themselves. And also it's also usually not the other extreme where we're gonna put all of the parameters under evolutionary control. It turns out that in practice some bright humans can see how some of these values should be set to bias the kinds of behavior that we want. For example, we probably know that all of the, uh, all of the biases should not be zero, right? Because then you're going to get something that just, unless there's stuff coming in from the outside world, all this is, the neurons will very quickly go to zero. The robot will forget anything that happened in the past, probably not a good thing to do, right? So hopefully even given the fact that you've just learned about this, you might already start to have some intuition for how things should go here, right? Think about the taus. Generally speaking, what are unreasonable values for tau? Let's imagine we're gonna drop this CTRNN into a robot and we're gonna try and evolve that robot to run, it's a legged robot. We're gonna let evolution tinker with everything else here, but there's certain values of taus we might tell evolution stay away from those values. Zero, right? Anything very close to zero, you're gonna get very rapidly changing neurons and you're gonna get chaos, chaos in the mathematical sense of chaos, right? There is a lot of noisy stuff going in, on inside the head of this robot, which is going to make it harder for evolution to orchestrate the movement of the legs by producing smooth changes in the neurons. Which reminds me, I haven't yet said how this is connected to the world, right? How these are connected to the neurons. In practice, although I don't have a slide for this, we take some other subset of our hypothetical 27 neurons and we tag those neurons as motor neurons. And after we've computed the new value of all 27 neurons, we take the six motor neurons and we read out this value from those six neurons, from those six differential equations. And the sigma is a reminder to us that if we read out this entire term from the jth neuron, we're going to get a value between minus 1 and plus 1. The motor will treat that value as a torque and apply it to the motor, and off we go, as we did with more traditional neural networks. Yeah? So far, so good. Any other questions about the theory behind CTRNNs before we see how they're useful? No? Okay, so uh, I'm going to introduce an experiment from 2008 here. This is a very, this is one of the more complicated experiments we're going to see. I don't expect you to remember all the details. This discussion of this experiment is actually more for the graduate students that are here today. Undergrads, if you can follow this, that's great. If not, 
that's okay. Um, one of the big challenges in robotics at the moment is known as a functional hierarchy. I'm running out of space here. Which, as the name implies, literally is if we want a robot to do complicated things, it is probably going, the robot is going to have to hierarchically compose its functions or the things that it does. And what do I mean by hierarchically organizing those functions? It means stacking one behavior on top of another over time. So for example, uh, throughout your day, not now, but later, you're going to be walking. Your legs are going to be scissoring back and forth. And at the, time, at the same time that you're doing that relatively fast task, left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg, you may be holding a conversation with a friend while you're talking, which involves the muscles in your larynx and your lungs, which sort of unfolds over a slower time scale as you're walking. And you can probably start to think of many examples like that as well. I could, for example, walk from this side of the board to that side of the board, where I am also scissoring my legs at about half a second, and gradually draw a line that descends along the whiteboard. The motion of my arm will occur at a much slower time scale as the movement of my legs, right? It's like walking and chewing gum at the same time. Humans and, and, and organisms are good at doing multiple things at the same time, but some of those things unfold more rapidly or more slowly than others. Very difficult thing to get a robot to do. In addition, we are also capable of doing one thing, then another thing, going back to A, going back to B, repeating A, B, A, B, A, B in a sequence over time, like left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg, while on top of that we add a hierarchical alternation. Take five steps at walking speed, five at running speed, five at walking speed, five at running speed. We're sequencing some functions over time, one after the other, and hierarchically packaging them into larger and larger uh, and more complex tasks. Okay. Basic takeaway here is we want to train a robot not to just do one thing, but be able to do multiple things, do those multiple things at faster to slower times, and hierarchically organize them together into more and more complex tasks. Question? Uh, same distribution or different distribution depends on the actual task we're talking about, right? How different is that, that task? So this is maybe a partial answer to your question. There are different ways we could think about building a C tier and N to allow a robot to do that. Let's say that we want the robot to do three different things, which are represented in the cartoon here by green, red, and blue. You'll notice that they're bouncing up and down. To simplify this, imagine that there's three different things we want a robot to do, but it only has one motor, right? Rotate your arm uh, with the green curve at a slow frequency and low amplitude. Then switch and do something in red, uh, high frequency, high amplitude. Then do something in blue, same frequency and same amplitude, but at a different offset. So three different things. Move this one motor in three different ways, one after the other. Question. The way that we would do it? Yep. You mean generalized to a fourth task? Good question. That's not covered in the experiment we're going to talk about today. But if we train a robot to be able to do multiple things and stitch them together in different temporal sequences, do A, B, C, then do A, C, B, who knows? Is, does the robot gradually become capable, become a better generalist? It's now easier for it to do D when we ask it to do D. That is a good question, but that's not tackled in this paper. We'll actually come back to that idea later in the course. OK, so there's multiple things we want the robot to do. And we're thinking about how to build this C tier and N. We probably can't build it all by hand. We're going to let evolution fill in some of the details. But again, maybe we could give it a hint. 
So we could create three modules in, in uh, the CTRNN. What do I mean by a module? We have 27 neurons. We take the first third, we wire them all up with synapses. We take the second third, wire them up with synapses. Do the same thing with the third. And we now have three connected components with 27 differential equations. They're, each group is influencing the other neurons in its group, but not influencing any of the neurons from the other groups. So we have three talking sets, three non-overlapping sets of neurons that talk to one another. Evolution might then uh, not, not play with W, because we set W. We said these can talk to one another and these can't. Maybe plays with some of the other parameters so that one of the neurons in the first group produces the green curve. Its rate of change over time is what we're looking for. Second group, one of the neurons in there produces the other pattern we're looking for. Same thing with the third one. So we're getting closer now. We have three parts of the robot's brain and it's thinking, quote unquote thinking, or it's able to dream up what it should be doing. We add a fourth component. We add another bunch of neurons that act as a gate and again, hard for us to know how to set the parameters to do that, but those additional neurons are looking at a clock and they're saying, okay, it's the first third of the evaluation period. I'm gonna let the value of that neuron from the first group through and connect to the neuron. After a while, the gate says, stop. Time has elapsed. It shuts the gate on the first group and opens the gate for the second group, and that neuron sends its value through synapses, through the gate, and out to the motor, right? So you've got this additional gating mechanism that is deciding who is which part of the robot's brain is allowed to control the robot at any given time. We actually saw a simpler version of this back towards the beginning of the course when we talked about the history of AI, and we talked about subsumption architecture. This is the little circuit that's inside a Roomba vacuum cleaner, if you have one at home, right? As long as the, the Roomba isn't being bumped, go forward. If there's a bump, stop and let some other part of the circuit inside the Roomba turn the wheels, turn the, the Roomba. Now it's not being bumped anymore. That, P, that part, the turning mechanism is suppressed and the gate that allows forward motion is opened again, right? It's an old idea in AI that if we want something to do multiple things, like go straight across the carpet and turn if you bump into something, then we create different parts of the circuit, or in our case, different parts of the neural network. So far, so good. What's the drawback of this approach? Okay. So there may be there may be challenges here that it's hard to it forgets or it's hard to hold on to all these things. We're trying to make that easier by making a modular network, these three modules inside. So let's assume we don't have that problem. Let's assume we actually achieve making a CTRNN like the cartoon in A, which enables a robot to do three different things. That sounds great. What's the problem? Okay, maybe, so if something happens to the gate, we've got a problem, the robot does the wrong thing at the, at the wrong time. That could happen. But let's keep going. Let's assume things don't break. There's still a problem with this. Well, I guess this would be before you were able to get it right, but it can't evolve the weights. So that seems like it would have to be. That is, that's a good point, right? So if we are cutting, we are snipping the weights or the connections between the modules, and not allowing evolution to play with the weights, we've, we've probably hobbled evolution. That's a good point. So let's take a step back. We are going to zero out some of these weights. So we're still going to snip some of the weights, but the remaining weights, evolution can play with those. Okay, so we fixed that problem. Still, there's a problem with this. Hopefully, you all are capable of exhibiting more than three behaviors. You can walk, run, jump, write, talk, play an instrument, play a sport. How many behaviors are you capable of? It's hard to know how to count, right? But it's definitely a lot more than three. Do you think you have a little part in your brain dedicated 
to taking notes. You have one module for taking notes in E430 and another module for taking notes in another room and another room. It's not a scalable solution, right? Maybe it works for a robot where we want to teach it to do three or a dozen things, but if we can scale this up and we can create a system where we're teaching robots thousands or hundreds of thousands of different tasks, our C tier and N is going to grow from 27 differential equations to hundreds to thousands to millions and we're dead in the water. So is there a smarter way we can do this? Yes. That, there, that's true. The neural Turing machine is, is, is kind of an update to this paper. That's right. Okay. So we're going to focus, we're going to focus just on this paper and again this idea of exploiting the machinery of CTRNNs to make the system more scalable. And by more scalable, I mean that it would get easier and e it would be easier to train it to do more and more things. How are we going to do that? Well, how did the investigators do it? What they did is kind of uh, visualize in cartoon form here in panel B. They did not cut any of the synapses. What they did instead, maybe I can show it in the next picture here, is they set one subgroup of neurons to have a tau value of five, and the other subset of neurons, the slow neurons, to have a tau of 70. So they are automatically speeding up and slowing down the behavior of neurons in the CTRNN. So the only intuition that the investigators are really bringing to this experiment is it's going to help evolution if there are already a, a, a batch of slow neurons and fast neurons. Okay, why is that, why is that helpful? Imagine we have our fast neurons and remember that the neurons in here are being influenced by other neurons and also values that are coming in from the sensors of the robot. We haven't talked about the robot yet, right? So you can think of all those incoming uh, values as obviously influencing the behavior of not just one neuron, but collective behavior. So for some set of inputs, they quote unquote push the fast neurons into a situation where one of them produces the red curve. We then change our influence and quote unquote push or input a different set of values and all the, neuro all the fast neurons start doing something else. They settle down and one of them, maybe it's a different one, starts to exhibit the blue curve. Do it again, change the influence and now someone in the fast group exhibits the green curve. We don't have time to get into this, but this is an interesting thing about sets of coupled ordinary differential equations, is they don't just exhibit arbitrarily different behavior when you influence them in different ways. They settle, they tend to settle on their own into different default patterns. For some subset of incoming values, like from the inputs, they push all of the neurons and they settle to produce one pattern. Push them again from the outside, they change and settle into a different pattern. Kind of an interesting mathematical uh, phenomenon. Evolution, by tuning all of these parameters, can influence what that settled pattern looks like for a given set of inputs. Yeah? Okay, we won't talk more about the math side of this for a moment, but that gives us the following ability. The slow units, the slow neurons, are gonna connect to the fast neurons. And you can think of the slow neurons as like a conductor for an orchestra. The orchestra are the fast neurons. They're doing their thing at a certain pace. And the slow neurons are slowly changing their influence on the fast neurons, which are pushing the fast neurons into one pattern or another. Evolution is going to tune the parameters of all of these neurons so that for a given signal, we get the red, another the green, another the blue. So far, so good? Okay, I'll show you some actual data in a moment so you can see this at work. Let's talk about the robot for a moment. Uh, as you can see in the little cartoon here, uh, they used a little humanoid robot. It's got two arms. They place a little block in front of it. And the fitness function, so to speak, is as follows. They tell the robot that they want the robot to do certain things in a certain order. 
So the fitness function says if we give, if we input this number into the neural network, that, that's a signal from outside saying we want you to do the following. So this neuron, so this robot has traditional touch sensors and angle sensors, but it also has a quote unquote ear. It has one neuron that receives numbers from the scientists outside, and that number, different numbers mean different things. The fitness function is going to tune the neural network so that when it hears this number, it goes to the home position, puts up its hands, it then reaches for the object, it then grabs the object and shapes it up and down three times, and then returns to the home position. That's for one number. If we input a different number into the ear of the robot, it does this instead. Grab the block, shake it left and right, let go. We send in a third number, it does backwards and forwards three times, let's go, and so on. So the fitness function is going to train the neural network so that when you hear this number, do this sequence of tasks. When you hear that number, do this other sequence of tasks. CTRNNs that produce closer behavior to what it was supposed to do during those times gets higher fitness and, is, and survives in the population and produces offspring. Again, I'm kind of covering up some of the, the details, but hopefully you get the basic idea. What did they do? Again, they, the investigators set the values of, ta of tau. They slowed and sped up some of the neurons, and they let evolution tinker with the Ws, the Gs, and the thetas. At the end, uh, I mean, we're not going to talk about the details of this. Gra for the grad students, this is a worthwhile paper to dig into and learn the details of. Okay, what did they see at the end? They saw something that looks like this. All of these panels on the left here are readouts from one evolved CTRNN controlling that little humanoid robot that I just showed you. Okay, in this left column here, the investigators sent in a number to the CTRNN and that number meant that the robot should shake the block up and down three times and then left and right three times. Take this, they took the same evolved CTRNN and input a different number, and in that case, the robot was supposed to shake the block backward, backwards and forwards three times. Yeah? Same neural network, same robot, it just hears two different things, and lo and behold, it does the correct thing. It's a little difficult to see from its sensors here what it actually did, I think the easiest one here is to look at this, the third row here, which is the robot's proprioception. So proprioception is the term for feeling the movement of your own limbs, which for the robot is the angle sensors in the rotational joints. You'll notice that the angle joints, the angle, uh, the angle sensors are oscillating three times at a low number, and then those same angle sensors are oscillating three times at a different average value, right? So this is kind of like this and then this, right? It's the same angle sensors. In both cases, there's an oscillation three times, but there's a difference between these three sets. So I think this panel sort of gives you an idea for what the robot was actually doing, which is... It shook the, shook the block up and down, and then left and right. How, what was the CTRNN doing to enable that? In this case, they didn't, use, uh, 20, they didn't use 27 neurons. They actually used, uh, let's see here. They had 100 neurons, which were sensor and motor neurons. They're not even shown in this picture. Then they had an additional, uh, they had an additional, 80 neurons, neuron 101 through 180. And those were hidden neurons. Those are the ones that are inside. Some of those hidden neurons were fast neurons, neurons 101 through 160. And neurons 161 through 180 were slow neurons. What happened here? Tell me about these two panels, these two panels here.
you can see if you look carefully at the fast neurons that there is an oscillation three times. So black, a black pixel represents that that row, that neuron, was darkening. It, was, it had a, a large value at a given time. A value near a, a, a whiter pixel meant that that neuron was less active at that time. So you can see the 100 and, uh, the 60 fast neurons blinking on and off over time. And if you squint at this, you can notice that they're collectively exhibiting three oscillations. And then they exhibit three different oscillations. And those three, those two sets of three oscillations are flowing through the fast hidden neurons into the motor neurons and causing the robot to do one, two, three, then one, two, three. So far, so good. In the slow neurons, the very lower left panel, you can see a little bit of an oscillation, at least in the second band, but in the right, the right hand side of the lower left panel. But importantly, you see less of that oscillation. So in essence, what the slow neurons are doing as collectively as a conductor is saying they're keeping their values relatively constant. Their influence, the slow neurons' influence on the fast neurons is constant. Play this tune, which is one, two, three. Now play this other tune, one, two, three. So the slow neurons have evolved, ever, or evolution has figured out how to turn the slow neurons into a conductor, how to input the same set of values into the fast neurons for a fixed period of time, which results in up-down motion. And then evolution has figured out how those neurons gradually switch to the slow neurons switch to a different set of output values, which are relatively constant, ah, relatively constant over the last half of the evaluation period here. And that different set of constant values pushes the fast neurons into a different oscillation, which results in a different pattern and the different correct pattern of now left and right. Question. So if I understand this correctly, that's, is that where the hierarchy comes in? Is that the slow neurons are saying, do this task, and the, the task neuron serve that is, okay, this task refers to this oscillation. Exactly. And when the slow neuron changes its signal, yep. it's focusing on different oscillations. So could this theoretically be scaled forever, having like a, high, a slower, faster, 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 for like, okay, move forward, okay, this one does, do this with the leg, do this with the joint. Perhaps, right? There's nothing to say that this couldn't be, couldn't continue, right? So instead of, two sets of tau, we create three sets, slow, medium, and, sl and s slow, uh, sorry, fast, slow, and really slow, right? We could keep adding on slower and slower time scales. And we might do that based on our own intuition. If you observe your own behavior, you may not notice it, but when you're walking to your next class, some part of your brain is saying to your legs, left, right, left, right, left, right. At the same time as maybe your more conscious brain is trying to maintain you know, a conversation with a friend, while yet another part of your brain is thinking ahead to spring break and how great it's gonna be when you eventually get there. You have a slower part of your brain which is thinking about things that are unfolding at a slower time scale, and you might be doing things at the very slow time scale to prepare for that. It's often how it feels, right? Your brain is managing multiple behaviors at the same time. Luckily, you're not conscious of all of those things. And it feels like some of those things are being orchestrated to occur at fast time scales, medium time scales, slow. Thinking about thinking is misleading, right? When you feel that occurring, you're managing something that's happening quickly. You're also managing something that's occurring slower. You're preparing for something that's an unfolding in time even slower. Is that really what's going on in your brain? Who knows? What we do know from neuroscience is that there are neurons in the brain which on average tend to react slower and faster regardless of their input. There are Eeyore and Tigger neurons in uh, biological nervous systems. Does it support these, this kind of behavior which is managing multiple time scale behaviors over time. Managing functional, functional hierarchy. Nobody knows. 
We'll pause there. Um, details of this experiment will not be in the quiz. As I mentioned, this is mostly for the graduate students, but you do have a quiz due tonight. Uh, you're working on assignments four, seven, or eight. Uh, I will see you on Tuesday. Thank you.